Michael, many thanks for um, accepting my invite. So I would, you know, rather than me doing the intro, I would say, you know, if you can quickly introduce yourself and what you do and about your startup in simple words. Yeah, so to put it short and sweet, um, my name is Mike Laughlin. I'm from Butterant. It's a small town in North Cork. Uh, I studied product design and technology in the University of Limerick. And during my final year there, the idea of horsepay was born. So that is two years ago now at this stage. We're two years down the line. We're after a successful crowdfunding campaign. Um, so we're excited and looking to the future for that really now. Grand, grand, grand. Yeah, it must be exciting times uh, for you. Uh, in fact, I, I think let's start with the startup idea itself. And uh, I think uh, I, I've read it somewhere that the idea obviously has some sort of a personal connection to you. So my my question to you is one, A, how did you come to the idea and why you decided to do it? And B, um, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurship or building an idea, how much do you think a personal connection is important? So the first question you asked was, how did it come about? So I kind of feel like the idea was almost ticking around, like straight in front of in front of us for so long. Like it was just the, the kind of eureka moment came when I was talking with um, Ian Gilmore and Shane McCarthy a couple of years ago. We were talking about another project and then it just all seemed to click into place about how we would solve the massive problem that there is with the horse industry. And... Um, my personal connection then would be why I knew so much about the issue. And so basically um, the majority of people would have been cut out or misled when buying and selling horses or ponies. And it's very difficult to resolve the issue. If you can resolve it, it quite often goes unresolved. So we're able to sort that out by, with a built-in payment platform and it allows uh, it allows us to hold the payment for up to a week so you can get your horse home make sure that he's as described make sure there's no undisclosed voices so that's where the personal connection was massively useful now you said is it essential um, I don't know if it's essential but it helps hugely because if you're working early in the morning and late at night on a project that may not necessarily be paying you at all for a long time and yeah. um, you need the personal connection or in the way that you'll have knowledge on the subject and you'll really care about it and you it's a good driving force so okay. i think it is it, it's not essential but it's a huge help I have. yeah yeah and i guess what, what you said is right i mean especially the part where you said that you know when you know that you might not be paid from this project for a, a, a considerable while it's good to have yeah. that personal connection now um how long has it been for you to you know started working on this now so from the idea coming about, it is two years ago since October. Okay. But we didn't really launch properly until the following October. So that's a year and a bit that we had the website up and going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like if you're talking about when the idea came about, there was another year mm. of trashing about ideas back and forth. And yeah, yeah. That, no. that is a lengthy process as well. Now, now let's say, you know, if you were to rewind two years back, you know, what are the three things that you know today that you might tell your younger self, like two years before when you're before you start this? What was what would those three things be? Uh, time management. Oh my God, the amount I've learned on time management over the last couple of years is insane. <laughs> uh, if you do, if you don't have good time management, you'll be running around in circles. You'll get nowhere. Um, so if you can perfect it, the only way you can perfect it really is just to experience bad time management. I think. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have done that, and so that's how I've kind of come out on the other side now. Um, time as well. Uh, another learning about time is that time and knowledge are uh, they're so much more useful and valuable than actual funds. Because if you have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the time or you don't have the knowledge, you can't do anything with it. So they need to be there first in order to have success. I think and. and uh, the third thing then would be, um, I think you need to make compromises, so about your own life and compromises about the idea. So like we you, we would have spent a lot of time um, working with developers and trashing out different ideas and trying to perfect different um, user experiences. And done is often better than perfect. I think like you could spend two weeks trying to do something and you could have had an idea done after two days. 
which you spent the other 12 days trying to perfect it. And if you just do this and just did, just make a decision and go with it, it's quite often better than perfect, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, since you've built something from scratch, can I, can I ask you, how was that product uh, development cycle like? I mean, I know you said you put one year from idea to development, you know, but let's say on the launch date, uh, I mean, is the product completely ready or do you still see another, I don't know, two, three months before it's perfected? How How, how is that product development cycle like? So we started out with... Um, different kind of uh, prototypes and we user tested them extensively before we ever went to making the actual product. So that's where all the iterations were done for the existing product. And that's the cheapest way to do it. There's no point in doing it. Um, do you know, if you can do it just purely on the front end without putting any real money into it. And then once you know what you want, get it built. That's by far the best way to do it. So the product we have at the moment is, I'm very happy with it. Um, but no doubt there is massive room for expansion with it and just further development. So it's more in the way that we'll be able to develop on what we built. Like what we built, I'm very happy with, but it's only a small section in what we're yeah. going to be doing. I understand. Now, uh, in terms of, let's say, the first 100 days, and, and when I say first 100 days, I mean first 100 days after the launch, yeah? Yeah. Uh, what, what, would, what was your milestones like? I mean, what was it all about? Was it about sales or was it about testing the technology? I mean, where was your headspace like? After launching the product, um, you see, I think talking to people really was the massive milestones because you just learn so much more than being in your own bubble. Yeah. Um, so then you also get, you open numerous doors into different areas like, and it just, uh, it expands your idea so much more. So like getting, getting real encouragement from people who knew nothing about the idea was a massive milestone. And then opening the new doors, and then like it's, there's massive highs and lows with it. So like, it's so, it can be thankless for a while, but then when you do, in the first 100 days, you start to really see the traction coming together. So it's exciting, like, but it's exciting. I'm trying to think what the actual milestones are. Um, it's hard to say really with the first 100 days, it's kind of a gradual growth but it's the very first launch when you see a massive milestone and you just broaden the horizons. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk about your founding team. Uh, I've looked at the team and it essentially looks like a very powerful and complementing sort of mix. Mm. So, you know, if, if you are to give an advice to uh, an entrepreneur who's also looking for co-founders, uh, two things, my question is one, uh, what would from your own learnings, you know, working with these co-founders, what really ticked? Was there a personal connection or was it more of a complementary skill sets? W what works according to you? Uh, two of the massive um, things working in our favor. We have a very diverse team and the team has a whole, they have um, massive amounts of experience. So. It, it, the diverse team really complements each other. So like we've got Shane from marketing and he's just able to, he'd sell snow to an Eskimo. Like he's just able to analyze everything that way and like knows all our social media marketing. He and then he loves stats and figures and he's able to come at things with a real matter of fact approach, which works very well for an awful lot of investors. Um, I had the knowledge on horses and ponies, so that has helped us no end. Um, so while I wouldn't have a lot of experience with startups, um, Shane and Ian would have had an awful lot. And then our, we outsourced our code then, so Ian would have already had a very good relationship with Nicola, who has written all of our code for us. And so like everyone has their strengths, yeah. and where one person yeah. place be lacking another one would pick up so a diverse team 100 percent is needed it is essential but um, but question is how did you find them did you, did you know oh, them before or I, like was I that met, important i met uh, shane and ian when i was working on a final year project so it's called the real world studio so it's a six-week project where fourth year students work with a company that's outside of the college and uh, they get a brief at the start of the six weeks they meet Mm -hmm. the founders they, or whoever is managing the project 
Yeah. And yeah. you work with them for six weeks. So I was working with Shane and Ian for those six weeks, which is when you right. No, no. So did that personal connection that you had before help? Or, you know, was that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Massive, yeah. yeah. All right. And uh, in terms of getting here, no, I mean, in terms of from the idea to developing it, uh, how do you manage uh, the resources required for it? And when I say resources, I mean particularly funding. And I, I know we will talk about the crowdfunding part in a bit. But before that, you know, how did you manage that initial set of funding? Was it all about, okay, how four of you did not get paid? Or was there some, you know, some sort of a seed round going on? So the very first thing that got the ball rolling for us was the IBOE competition, which uh, yeah. was run by the Leo. So that, um, we actually got an award from that. So we got a bit of money from that. Okay. It's, it gave us a little bit of a kickstart, which we needed. And then we also built a very good relationship with the local enterprise office. So I can't emphasize that enough. They offer massive support, both funding-wise and um, advice. So we have a very good relationship with them. It has been incredibly useful since the very start. Um, and but then, then that being said, they match fund. So you need money. In order for them to be beneficial to you, you need yeah. money. So yeah. if you get a couple of the angel investors, we had the competition money. Um, but if you, can, if you don't have access to that, you get a couple of the angel investors because you need to spend money to be awarded the grants. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And, and you were talking about building the technology. I know you, one of the founders wrote the, uh, sorry, one of your team members wrote the code. Uh, so what, was it all managed outside as in, you know, I mean, there were, I'm guessing there's multiple people involved. So my question to you is, you know, when you initially build it, build a technology product, is it best advisable to A, hire your own team, build it, or, you know, get it made by an outsourced team and have the code for yourself? What, what's the best strategy? If you have the skills, work away, um, more power to you like, but we didn't have the skills and Ian already had a good relationship so with, with Nicola, so it worked very well for us to outsource it. We could have put time, uh, we could have invested an awful lot of time into learning how to do it, but like we very much believe in play to your strengths and maximize them and then where you need to outsource, just do it and you'll save an awful lot of time. When you have first mover advantage as well, it's only useful when you move quickly. So we couldn't afford the time yeah. that it would have taken. So for us, I would say outsource what you don't, mm. outsource what you're not skilled in. And Got it. yeah. All right. And uh, uh, in terms of those initial customers that you had, right? I mean, I, I know you've had that initial, some bit of initial traction. Was that a, a result of a couple of marketing things coming together or was it the team themselves going onto the ground and getting it done? I mean, how was the mix like? I mean, the first get, get onto the ground, get into the market, talk to people, meet people. I spent every Sunday and an awful lot of Saturdays going to every show, every event that was on, um, was it last, not last summer, but the summer before. Like, I mean, every weekend I was out talking to people, meeting people, spreading the word, uh, user testing. Every week we'd have something new. I'd be asking people about it. And I would actually meet people at one show and they would have heard about us from another show, from another person. And it just got people talking. And by far and away, that was the best way we found to get traction at that. Because like people, there's an awful lot of scams now lately. Like people don't exactly trust what they see on the screen yeah. all the time. But if you're standing in front of someone, you're there, there's no messing. Like yeah. this is what yeah. we're trying to trust. Got it, got it. And, uh, you know, in terms of raising funds, I know you spoke about this, but let's say if you're to put three points, uh, you know, that are key factors for someone to put money in a venture. I mean, from your own perspective, what do you think? And I, I'm, not, I'm not just talking about the crowdfunding, I'm talking in general, you were able to raise funds from different sources. You know, if you're to say, these are the three things that helped us to get that money off, what would they be? Well, if you're going to raise funds, I think people need to our possible investors need to believe that you believe in the idea because yeah. no matter how good the idea is, if they don't feel that you're interested, if they don't feel you believe in it, they're not going to put money behind it. Okay. And that will also come through if you are one of the things we actually did and um, because of the grants we were getting from the local enterprise office was we did out a business plan and 
it was incredibly laborious, but it forced us to analyze parts of the business that we wouldn't have maybe thought about. And so that in turn then meant that we knew the company inside out. Yeah. All that we have done, all that we possibly will do, we we went through everything. And then that comes true because that comes true with possible investors because they will be asking you questions about everything. Like, yeah. so you need to know your company yeah. inside out. Yeah. So I have to say, they need to believe that you believe in it. Do a business plan because it will just force you to know everything there is to know about your business. And uh, if you can have a bit of traction as well, that always helps. That helps, now. yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Uh, now, I, I think, okay, finding funds is one part, but then running a crowdsourcing campaign is a different ball game altogether. Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I've always looked at crowdfunding from a third party or a bird size, and I've seen only, you know, you know, one of those crazy innovative ideas or a product, like, you know, a tangible product getting crowdfunded. But, you know, you are a service model, you're a building a tech. Um, I, I know it's going to be challenging, but you managed it. You you are, I think, 115 percentage crowdfunded for, you know. Yeah, we got to 120 in the finish. That's that's brilliant. So, you know, yeah. what, what, what worked for you, according to you? I mean, you know, how were you able to achieve that? So we had a massive marketing plan. We were meeting every couple of days, doing all different plans, different tactics, testing what was working. And we were all uh, analyzing every bit of income we were getting, where it had come from, and then maximizing that area. Uh, social media was, if it wasn't for social media, we wouldn't have reached our target because you've just got such a massive reach. Yeah, um, yeah. No, there's all there's always the few angel investors, but we were able to um, just target so we were able to target so many people that even if small investment, like we had something like 130 investors, I think it was, it was a massive amount. So yeah, I just think the reach really helped us and the videos and all the posting, consistency. You need that consistency to be every couple of days or every day even at times just in front of people, letting them know what we're doing, what stage we're at, if we yeah. need a bit of extra. Because people want to help, like, people yeah. actually, they, they want to help you if they see this, look, we put up a campaign kind of saying, we've got this much time left, we're this much short, mm. we need yeah. your help. And yeah. Yeah. they rallied the troops and got us that. Grand. All right, okay. So, uh, uh, in terms of marketing, I know you said social media work, but uh, it, was, was there any specific channel that, you know, sort of nailed it for you? Any certain um, social media website? Yeah, no, no, I'm saying Facebook, was it? Yeah. Okay, I, I think we, we spoke about this. You were talking about uh, specific Facebook groups. What, what was your learnings from that? Um, so we were, or I was personally a member of uh, multiple groups and they reach thousands upon thousands of people yeah so whatever we were posting on facebook i was able to share into those groups and increase the reach we had an increase of i think it was between 450 and 500 thousand percent of an increase on our on our site traffic and on our uh, page traffic yeah. so that was absolutely massive for us great great all right, so um, what is next for Hostpay, I think? So with the successful completion of the crowdfunding, what's next? Well, what's next for Hostpay? We have got a lot of product development planned. Mm. We have a bit of diversification. So it works so well for us in the team. We're going to do it with the business as well. We think it is a crucial element. And so there's a lot of talks about that. I'm going to keep my cards a little bit close to my chest about what we're going to do, but <laughs> we've right, got a lot right. of stuff in the pipeline. <laughs> okay. And then we, we, we're going to expand into the UK and into the US as well. So just scale. Yeah, scale yeah. scale up. All right, great. All right, so Michael, I think we are uh, round about the last question. So just two quick last questions for you. One, as an entrepreneur, what keeps you going? I mean, I, I know that the first two years and even the down, the path down is not going to be easy. Uh, like you said, there were sacrifices made. So A, what keeps you ticking? B, what's your message for budding entrepreneurs? So what keeps me going is um, I try to think positive as much as I can. 
So I definitely learned that from my mother. She is the most positive woman I've ever met. Um, and like the law of attraction, positive thoughts bring positive things towards you. So yeah. that's a massive help, but like it won't get you everywhere. You know, you need to you need to uh, constantly think about the future. Like so, I try to learn and know exactly what I want because if you don't know what you want, you can't get it. So yeah. I try to just keep a clear head, know what I want, analyze the steps and how to get there, and just try and tick the box and just day by day. Just take it day by day or even week by week because if you think of the big picture too much, it's essential to think about the big picture every now and then. But you, if you do it the whole time, you'll just get lost and your mind will get boggled. So I find that uh, oh, what I do as well is lists. Mm. So even going down, breaking down the day to day further, I break it down into a list. So I write down everything that needs to be done for the day. Then I prioritize the list. What's urgent? What needs to be done first? What can wait till tomorrow? And if it wasn't for this list, if it wasn't for these lists that I do, I def- I guarantee you I wouldn't be where I am at the moment because it just plays into the time management. So it, it's one top tip that I can't recommend enough. And what was the other question you said? Uh, advice for budding entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, so one quote I heard and it really resonated with me was, if it's important to you, you'll find a way. If not, you'll find an excuse. So... Yeah. <laughs> you want this, you can get it. And like it's it's kinda like um do you know the there was a speech with um Shia LaBeouf and he's gone crazy on the screen and he's just saying, just do it. Like, you know, people spend a lot of time thinking about what they're doing. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his um with his video, but it's definitely worth uh, a search. He's just going mental, just do it. If you're thinking of doing something, don't think about it. You Yesterday you said to do it tomorrow, so just do it. Just go ahead, like stop thinking too much. Now obviously you think a little bit. Just get, just get <laughs> all it done. Right, right. Well said, Michael. Point on. All right, so I, I think that's that's it. I think we have covered all the points, Michael. Um, 